Oh, hello, fellow archaeologists. Let me introduce myself. I'm Arizona Smith. Oh, and please excuse this mess. I just got back from a dig in the ancient Egyptian city of Dashur, searching for clues, you know. See this? It's a scarab I found in the desert. One more small clue to add to the thousands of others that tell us what life was like in ancient Egypt and what an incredible life it was. 5,000 years ago, along the banks of the Nile River in northeastern Africa, rose one of the earliest and greatest civilizations. It was a land of great pyramids, of the amazing Sphinx, of powerful and wealthy rulers. The ancient Egyptians loved life, and they had a pretty interesting idea about how to make it last forever. Ever heard of King Tut? He was only a kid when he came to the throne, probably younger than many of you. And he wasn't a very important ruler. But he left us an archaeologist's dream, a tomb full of riches and fabulous clues. In Egypt, even the earliest archaeologists had a problem. Robbers had gotten there first. Time after time, archaeologists would uncover a ruler's tomb, expecting to find fabulous riches, only to find it empty. The robberies often took place soon after the pharaoh was buried. In ancient times, later pharaohs hid their tombs, placing them deep in the mountains of the Valley of the Kings. But robbers usually found those tombs, too. In 1922, an English archaeologist named Howard Carter had been searching for the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun for six years. He was almost out of money. Soon he would have to send his workmen home. But in November of that year, his luck changed. The workmen uncovered a step, then an underground passage. Finally, a door blocked by large stones. With trembling hands, Carter broke open a small hole and peered in. Carter couldn't believe his eyes. There were golden couches, food and wine, everything to ensure the king's comfort on a long journey. For the Egyptians believed that the soul could live on after death, but only if the body was preserved too. Carter pressed on, hoping for the biggest prize of all. In the next chamber, he found it. Nested inside several cases, Carter uncovered a gilded sarcophagus in the likeness of a king. His hands were crossed upon his chest, holding the emblems of Egyptian rulers, a flail and a crook. Inside, the king's mummy wore a death mask made of 22 and a half pounds of gold. Howard Carter had uncovered the greatest archeological treasure in history, untouched for more than 3,000 years. Today, King Tut's treasures, and many of the royal mummies, are in Egypt's Cairo Museum. The royal line is carefully preserved in climate-controlled cases. How to make a mummy, an ancient Egyptian recipe. First, remove the organs from the body. That means take out the brain, the lungs, and the liver. The Egyptians took out the brain by breaking the person's nose, sticking a long hook up his nostrils, and then pulling the brain out bit by bit. Yuck! Next, wash the rest of the body with wine to kill germs. Then, 
Treat the body with a kind of salt called natron. That dries it out. Finally, wrap the body in hundreds of yards of linen and bury it in the dry sand of the desert. The Egyptians thought thinking was done with the heart. So, to help the person in the afterlife, they left the heart in the body. They didn't even bother to save the brain because they thought it was worthless. But the Egyptians were pretty smart about making mummies. Many are still well preserved today, thousands of years later. Finding King Tut's tomb was a fantastic discovery, great detective work. But think about it. Tut was only pharaoh for nine years, and we're talking about a civilization that lasted 3,500 years. Of course, there were ups and downs through the centuries, feuding nobles, foreign invaders, peasant revolts, the usual stuff. But Egypt always seemed to bounce back. Oh, this is Karnak. He won't bite. How you doing, old buddy? Want to meet some young friends? Anyway, it all started around 3000 BC. That's when the ruler of Upper Egypt, King Menes, conquered his rivals in Lower Egypt and united the two kingdoms. In ancient times, Upper Egypt was the long fertile strip that borders the Nile River. Lower Egypt was the area around the mouth of the river as it flowed into the Mediterranean Sea. These names can be confusing when you look at a map because Lower Egypt is on top of Upper Egypt. But it must have made sense to the Egyptians because the Nile River flows from south to north. The Old Kingdom, the first great age in ancient Egypt, was when the Great Pyramids were built and the Sphinx. As time went on, though, the nobles grew too powerful and split the country apart. Peace was finally restored when a family from Thebes took power, beginning the Middle Kingdom, the second great age of ancient Egypt. We know about this period from the many fine hieroglyphic writings we've found. Things were pretty stable again for about 400 years when a people called the Hyksos invaded from the east and conquered part of Egypt. Eventually, they were driven out by a succession of warrior pharaohs who established the last great age of ancient Egypt, the New Kingdom. The most celebrated of these warrior pharaohs was Ramses the Great. His reign may well have marked the height of Egyptian civilization. He ruled for almost 67 years and died around the age of 90. Remarkable, at a time when most people died before they turned 40. Ramses built more temples and more monuments than any other ancient ruler. In his spare time, he also fathered at least 90 kids. Well, with more than one wife, of course. For most of us, the most spectacular and puzzling thing about ancient Egypt is the pyramids. Why? Because they're so big, as tall as a 35-story building and as big around as nine city blocks. When you stand next to one, you feel like an ant. Who built these things? And how did they do it? To the ancient Egyptians, the ultimate goal was eternal life. So if you could afford it, you built your tomb of stone, not the mud brick of earthly houses. And if you were a pharaoh, your tomb could be as big as your imagination. The pharaoh's tombs began as flat structures called mastabas. But when the pharaoh Zoser wanted something grander, his architect, Imhotep, stacked mastabas on top of each other, reaching like a stairway to the sky. We call his first pyramid the Step Pyramid. Underneath, a maze of underground tunnels led to the king's burial chambers. Hollywood couldn't have done it better. There were trap doors, false passageways, and other tricks to trap robbers. Barely 200 years later came the first truly gigantic pyramid, the Great Pyramid at Giza. Originally, 
It was covered with a surface of polished white limestone. Back then, it would have been impossible to climb. But over the centuries, the outer layer was stripped away to help build the nearby city of Cairo. Standing guard nearby is the Great Sphinx, a lion with the face of the pharaoh Khafre. In ancient times, the Sphinx was brightly painted. Nope, not like that. Not like that either. Experts say its headdress had yellow and blue stripes. Historians once thought the pyramids were built by slaves, but now they think it was tens of thousands of peasants working for the pharaoh when they couldn't farm during the annual flooding of the Nile. The peasants could have floated the stones on rafts almost to the base of the Great Pyramid and then dragged them the rest of the way. Okay, so we know why the Egyptians built the pyramids. The big question is how? Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Arizona. Steph is our detective in training, and what have we got here? I'm working on a model that shows how the pyramids were built. The average stone in the Great Pyramid weighed several tons. Can you imagine moving something the weight of an, well, an elephant? That is amazing. And you know the Egyptians didn't have bulldozers or tractors, no pulleys, no wheels even to help them lift the stones. I know. Most scholars think that they use ramps made of dirt or rubble. Teams of laborers would pull the stones up the ramp, and when the level was finished, they'd raise the ramp and add a new level to the pyramid. Hmm, that's very good. And you know the teams sometimes inscribe their names on the stones, like Vigorous Gang or Craftsman Gang. Really? That is so cool. I can't believe there are more than two million stones in the Great Pyramid. <laughs> that sure is amazing. In many ancient cultures, women were controlled by their husbands. But in ancient Egypt, they had more freedom. They could have jobs and own property. When a woman got married, she still controlled the goods and land she brought with her to the marriage. And one woman even became pharaoh. Her name was Hot Shepsut, and some people called her the first great woman in history. Egypt has been called the gift of the Nile, and it isn't hard to see why. In this desert land, life centers around the river. The ancient Egyptians learned to predict the patterns of the Nile. Each year, the river would flood its banks, adding a fresh layer of topsoil. When the river receded, the farmers would plow and plant. Later, when the sun grew hot, a water wheel, or shaduf, would lift water from the river and spill it into canals, irrigating the fields. In ancient times, the banks of the Nile produced more grain than any place on Earth. The major crops were wheat and barley, used for making bread and beer. The ancient Egyptians believed that the gods and goddesses were responsible for the flooding of the Nile. In fact, for all their needs. The people depended on the pharaoh, the chief priest, to keep the gods happy. The ancient Egyptians had hundreds of gods and goddesses, and a mythology as rich as the Greeks and Romans. Steph preparing dinner. Looks like almost <clears throat> just like ancient Egypt. Well, after a long day of moving stones, you must be very hungry. You know, the Egyptians did us a favor. We know what they ate because they put food and drink in their tombs so they wouldn't go hungry in the afterlife. Well, we know rich people ate geese, ducks, and fish, but ordinary people just ate bread and vegetables. 
Yeah, they like cucumbers and carrots and garlic and onions and lettuce. Makes a great salad. I guess the art of dressing a salad must be an ancient one. Hey, how do you make hummus anyway? Well, you mash up chickpeas, then add tahini or ground sesame seeds, olive oil, garlic, and lemon. There, it's ready. Shall we see if Karnak likes it? Mm. <laughs> you suppose the ancient Egyptians had napkins? <laughs> <laughs> Many towels and clothes today have labels on them that say 100% Egyptian cotton. It's soft and fluffy. The Egyptians have made wonderful cloth for thousands of years. How do we know? Because mummies were wrapped in beautiful linen, and we often find bolts of cloth in tombs, too. Seems like the Egyptians wanted to be well-dressed in the afterlife. Did you know that the Egyptians were the first to use pen and paper for writing? They made their paper from the papyrus plant, which grew along the Nile. In fact, our word paper comes from the Egyptian word papyrus. I have some papyrus here to show you. Here it is. And here's Egyptian writing, a strange combination of shapes, objects, and symbols. They're called hieroglyphs. That's Greek for sacred carvings. For centuries, nobody knew what these hieroglyphs meant. It was like trying to figure out a secret code. The Egyptians were among the first to develop a system of writing. But after several thousand years, their writing changed, and finally, no one understood the beautiful hieroglyphs inscribed in the ancient tombs and temples. Then, in 1799, a great discovery provided the missing clue. An officer in the army of Napoleon Bonaparte, a great French general who had invaded Egypt, found an ancient stone tablet near the mouth of the Nile. The tablet was covered with text written in three writing systems hieroglyphs, a later Egyptian script, and a form of ancient Greek which was still understood by scholars. The tablet became known as the Rosetta Stone, and 24 years later, a language expert used it to unlock the secret code of the hieroglyphs. Today, Egyptologists, a fancy name for scholars who specialize in Egyptian studies, can read these ancient hieroglyphs. Joseph Wegner is an Egyptologist at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. This carved tablet marked the grave of a high official who lived about 3,000 years ago. Uh, the word achet, which means horizon, uh, then iabtet, uh, which means eastern, um, and then here, a neat pet, which means of, of the heavens. So, uh, when we read this in Egyptian, it sounds like dua raharachti, webenef em achet yabtet neat pet. So venerating raharachti uh, when he rises in uh, the eastern horizon uh, of heaven. Believe me, reading this stuff isn't easy. There are about 700 different signs. Some stand for one letter, others for two or three. If you think they look like little pictures, you're right. The Egyptians modeled the hieroglyphs after the people, objects, and animals in their world. Here are some more cool clues to the past they have at the museum. It's amazing what the Egyptians would put in their tombs. Little toys, playing pieces from an ancient board game, a child's sandal. How about 4,000-year-old bread, and hundreds of different amulets or good luck charms. Do you think kids played in ancient Egypt? Sure, they played board games, just like we do today. Okay, give me all your 
Camels. <laughs> Kids love to play ball, too. They raced and wrestled. Did they arm wrestle? Since everyone lived near the Nile River, I bet swimming was pretty popular. Mm, you just had to watch out for the crocodiles. Ooh, they must have been scary. And just think, you wouldn't have had any clothes on. That was true in or out of the water. It was so sunny and warm most of the times, kids didn't have to wear clothes at all. And most of them never went to school. They worked. If your father was a farmer, then that's what you learned to be too. Yeah, but see, I think I'd rather be a kid in a rich and powerful family. But then you'd have to go to school. Girls did it. They helped out in the family business. And they learned to weave the beautiful linen we find in the tombs. But the worst part was they got married at 12 or 14. Yuck. And they didn't even get to choose their own husbands. Their parents did. That's not good. This is ancient history, you know. I think I would have liked being a kid in ancient Egypt. Well, at least a boy. <laughs> not me. I really like my clothes. To the Egyptians, a dog was man's best friend and his hunting companion. Sheepdogs and greyhounds were favorite breeds, but cats were even more important than dogs because they took part in religious ceremonies. When a favorite cat died, sometimes his body was turned into a mummy, just like King Tut. This cat's mummy is at a museum now. After the rule of Ramses the Great, Egypt went into a long, slow decline Powerful neighbors invaded, including Alexander the Great, leader of the Macedonians. But he respected Egyptian civilization and actually established the last line of pharaohs. Finally, in 31 BC, it was over when Egypt became part of the Roman Empire. Not bad, though. A civilization that lasted more than 3,500 years, one of the longest ever. Compare that to the United States. We've only been around a couple of hundred years. Ancient Egypt made many contributions to the civilizations which followed, including ours. In the sciences, our calendar came to us from Egypt by way of Rome. Egyptians laid the foundations for geometry. They needed it to build their pyramids. The study of medicine also began in Egypt. Their art and architecture inspired countless civilizations and still inspires us today. My favorite invention of the ancient Egyptians is the notched key. Our clues are like notched keys. Each clue unlocks a door. And when we put all our clues together, we unlock the mysteries of our past. <laughs> That's what archeologists do, you know. <laughs> 